Okay, let's review some limits. I'd recommend pausing the video and seeing if you can solve these problems in your compositional book and then restart the video when you think you got an answer and check your answer. Okay, with both problems, remember with limits you should actually substitute first and see if you get your solution because a lot of times that will give you your answer. If we do that for the first problem and we substitute 5 in for x here, we get 5 cubed minus 4 times 5 plus 7. Well, that's 125 minus 20 plus 7, which comes out 112. So my limit is 112. For the second problem, if we replace x with negative 4, we get that 0 divided by 0, which remember is the indeterminate form, meaning there is an answer, we just got to do something else. Now with this being x cubed, I would recommend doing synthetic division. So remember, we're looking for the value that causes dividing by 0, in this case negative 4. We're going to put that out front. We're going to put the coefficients here, but we've got to pay attention here. We'll notice we're missing an x squared term and x term, so we've got to count for those by putting zeros. So we then, our, do, then do our synthetic division, multiply, add, multiply, add, and you see here you get 0. So this equation then becomes x squared minus 4x plus 16. And I can take x equals negative 4 and plug it into that and get 16 plus 16 plus 16. And so my limit then becomes 48. Hopefully that's the same answer you got. If so, you're getting good at limits now, which you should be at this point. Here's another limit problem, and again, you should always substitute, but again, when I substitute here, I get 0 divided by 0, which is that indeterminate form. It means I've got to do something else. Now, this is a problem with sign in there that synthetic division and factoring is not going to be really an option. So we've got to look at something else at the moment, and I would recommend a graph or a table here, which I have set up here for the problem here. These pro this problem requires you to use technology. And so if you look at the graph here, you can actually see that if you approach from the left side as x approaches 0, and you approach from the white right side, it looks like you get something a little bit higher than 3. So 3 point maybe 2 or so approximately. It's the best I can do if all they give me is a calculator. It's the best I can do. We will learn how to solve this one exactly later on, but for right now, we're just going to get an approximate answer. If you look at the table, you notice I set up my table really close to zero. And I actually pick values very close to zero, so only 0.1 away. And from both sides, you can see as I get closer and closer to, oh, there's a hole there, I am getting closer and closer to the value of approximately 3.2. So again, I would approximate 3.2. Please note, especially when I look at this table here, I can see undefined, and that dividing by zero problem cues me in that if I were to sketch this on paper, I would need to put a hole there the calculator would not show that hole. And that's how you graph. These are three different problems where one problem is a substitution, the second problem you have to do factoring or synthetic division, and this problem you have no choice but to use the calculator. There are three different ways to solve uh, problem, uh, limit problems, and this is an example of each one. Okay, let's review a problem of how to graph f of x equals x sine of x, and then use that to predict what the derivative would look like. I have a graph drawn here of this function f of x equals x sine of x. And now I'm going to start to imagine what this thing looks like. So first thing I notice is that, wow, it goes down, then it kind of levels off, then it goes up, levels off, goes down, levels off, goes up, levels off, goes down, levels off, and goes back up again. Okay, so this graph, from an increasing and decreasing behavior, does a lot. It goes up and down, up and down. So keeping in mind that whenever it's going down, my derivative is going to be negative, And whenever it's going up, it's going to be positive. will help me sketch this graph fairly accurately. Okay? So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to imagine that all these places where it's horizontal, that's going to be zeros of my function. So I know that my derivative is going to look like this. Let me change my colors here for my derivative here. Pick green. 
So when I graph my derivative, I'm going to first thing I'm going to start out with all the zeros. So all those maximums and minimums become zeros because those are places where they're going to cross the x-axis. I know the derivative has to cross the x-axis, sorry. And then it's just a matter of connecting them. So if I notice here, initially it's negative, it means it's got to be coming from below the axis when I connect it. And then between this, these two zeros, I can see it's going positive, so it's got to go above the axis. Again, I don't know high or how low. I've just got to connect it. And then in between these two zeros, I can see that it's negative, so it's got to become below the axis. Then these two zeros, again, it's positive. The function is increasing, so it's going to go above the axis. And then this part of the function is decreasing, so go below the axis, and then it goes back up. So this is what my prediction of the derivative would look like. And again, I'm going to use the notation f prime of x to represent the green function. So now I'm going to use the derivative feature of my calculator, d dx, to get what the calculator gives me. And you can see that the red function is relatively close to the green function that I graphed. Now my mountains are a little bit higher. Notice here. Mountain a little bit higher, valley a little bit lower. But that's okay because remember, that's, we're not going to be able to get that, how high those mountains are and how deep those valleys go as long as we get the general behavior. So we overall, we did a pretty good job of predicting what that derivative would look like. Okay, so what we're going to do is look at some applications of derivatives, um, in particular if you're in physics, how they can be applied to physics. So as you listen to this little presentation, make sure you take notes, answer these following questions in your compositional books. What's the relations between either a distance or displacement, or sometimes called a position function, and the velocity and acceleration of that same function? How are each represented on a graph of a distance or displacement function? And what is the difference between speed and velocity? Okay. So we're going to look at velocity, speeds, and rates of change. So here's a picture of a um, high velocity and high acceleration kind of situation. Um, the funny cars that go really, really fast, very quickly. Okay, so if we look at a distance function, which is this blue function here, we can actually find the average velocity by using our slope formula which we know is a change in y over change in x. In this case, it's the change in s, which is the change in distance, over the change in t, which is the change in time. So remember, this formula is just a slope formula. This is basically the same formula. It's a little bit fancier, but it's basically a slope formula. But notice here that when I get into instantaneous velocity, the only difference is the same formula, but the limit is now in front of that. And that's what makes it instantaneous velocity or instantaneous speed, which is, in this case, instantaneous velocity. So that kind of leads, leads into our first relationship that we need to be aware of, and that is that velocity is the derivative of position. You also need to be aware of is that speed is the absolute value of velocity. Velocity takes into account direction, so you'll either have a positive or a negative symbol telling you whether the direction is going up or down or forward or backwards. If you just look at the number itself, then the speed, that is what we call the speed. Acceleration is a derivative of velocity. So if you put those ideas together, you realize, oh, if I derive something twice, a distance function twice, that'll give me acceleration. So we also call this the second derivative. So from a notation standpoint, if we let s of t, or sometimes it's called x of t, be a distance or a position or a displacement function, then the velocity is the derivative of that function, which we write as ds dt. Again, s being the distance function. The acceleration is the derivative of velocity, which means it's the second derivative of distance. So those are relationships you need to be aware of that are applied to physics. From a unit standpoint, if distance is in feet, then velocity would be in feet per second, and acceleration would be in feet per second per second, which we um, abbreviate feet per second squared. Okay? So from a graph standpoint, we need to understand what the graph looks like. And basically, as we've noticed already, the derivative, which in this case is the velocity function, is get, gotten or looked at by looking at whether the function is going up or down. So in this case, you notice the function is going up until it gets to the top, and then it levels off, and then it goes down, and then it actually levels off. So from a velocity standpoint, that means the velocity is positive 
all the way here. You see how the velocity is positive. Up here, the velocity is zero because it leveled off. And then over here, the velocity is negative. And then over here, the velocity is zero. So again, the velocity isn't related to the increasing, decreasing functions that we've been looking at, or behavior. From acceleration standpoint, then what we look at is what we call concavity. Okay, and that's basically whether the curve is facing up or facing down. This is a curve up. Think of it as a spoon. You can hold something in there. Um, this is something that's curved down. If I turn the spoon upside down, I can't hold anything in there. Some people think of it as a smiley face and a frown face. Curving up, uh, concave up, you're smiling. Concave down, you're frowning. So if you notice here, this function here is actually curving up. Then it straightens out. If you notice, there's no curve here. Very straight. Then it's curving down. Then it's straight again. And then curving up. And straight. So from a concavity standpoint, you notice... that this first part, the acceleration, is positive because he's smiling. Here, the acceleration is zero because there's no frown and no smile. It's just going straight. Then at the top of this mountain, the acceleration is negative because frowning. And likewise here, if you notice it's straight, so the acceleration is actually zero. No frown, no smile. Over here, this part of the graph, He's actually got a little bit of a smile, so the acceleration is considered positive. And here, again, straight again, so the acceleration is zero. So again, first derivatives or velocity is looked at by looking at the, whether the function is going up or going down. The second derivative is looked at by determining whether the graph is concave up or concave down, whether it's smiling or frowning. So again, remember, average rate of change, which another word for that, is slope always looks like a formula that looks something like slope, y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. And I agree this isn't exactly in that format, but it certainly has that same feel to it. But again, the instantaneous rate of change is the same formula, plus it has a limit in front of it. That's what tells you that it's a derivative. And this is true for any function, whether it happens to be velocity and time or any kind of function, the derivative will always have that limit in front of a notation in front of that. Make sure you're taking notes on this and adding it to your composition notebook.